Jeremy, come on, man, we're gonna miss it. Come on, we gotta cross this tree line if we're gonna see it. Ah, fucking, come on. I don't wanna miss it, man. It only happens once every couple of weeks. It's gonna be right above us. Uh, where is it? Wait, do you hear that? Over there! This is Facing Worlds. It's a map from a multiplayer shooter released in 1999. It consists of two huge towers floating on an asteroid orbiting Earth. And it's one of the most iconic and fondly remembered maps in the history of multiplayer shooting. So that's why I'm talking about it, right? That's why 21 years later I feel compelled to create a video about this level. Because that's what YouTube is for in 2022. A bunch of aging gamers making hour-long impassioned video essays about old video game shit. So that other aging gamers can feel seen and remember a time when they were young and the world was a place full of possibilities, not a wasteland of broken dreams. So that's what I'm doing, right? Talking about one of the best video game maps ever made. Well, there's only one problem. For as much as I love it, Facing Worlds is terrible. All flash and no substance. Just a big, floating stalemate spinning around the Earth. But here I am, still talking about it. And you clicked the link, so clearly you care too. So why? Why do we still care about this terrible map? Hey, let's start with a history lesson. Unreal Tournament was released in 1999, a frankly disgusting year for the first person shooter. Having just put on a fresh pair of pants after 1998's Half-Life, 99 gave us Medal of Honor, System Shock 2 and Quake fucking 3 Arena, to say nothing of these. Epic Games was originally founded by Tim Sweeney in his parents' basement in Potomac, Maryland. Originally named Potomac Computer Systems, Tim was worried that his company didn't really sound like it was a company. It just kind of sounded like it was a guy in his parents' basement in Potomac, Maryland. So after the release of his first DOS game, ZZT, he opted to change the company's name. Something a bit more professional, you know? They made it look like a real operation. You know, not just a mom and pop Epic, Epic Mega, Mega games. games. I'm going to go right ahead and assume that a similar ethos is responsible for the name Unreal, the studio's first first-person shooter, which stood its ground in 1998. A frankly unfair year for any video game to come out, yet alone a first-person shooter on PC. Unreal was no Half-Life, but it had a lot going for it. Interesting weapons, novel enemies, and it looked pretty sharp too. Famously, it was the first screenshot to be printed on the cover of a magazine. But this scrappy studio, now based out of Cary, North Carolina, was set to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against a similar group of young upstarts in Mesquite, Texas. PC gaming was embracing online play, and it was time for the first-person shooter to fully commit. <laughs> Unreal Tournament was a delight for the senses. Great maps, great modes, great guns, great characters, great announcers, great pelvic thrusts. It was an absolute blast to play, a multiplayer sandbox with bunches of game modes pushed even further by mod support that had us matrix gun slow-mo kung fu kicking the fuck out of each other for years to come. But today I want to focus on one particular area, the maps themselves. Unreal Tournament adopted a no bad ideas in brainstorming ethos of map design, which led to a rather bemusing collection of arenas to pelvic thrust it. Years ago we travelled to Digital Extremes in Canada to do a documentary about Warframe. Digital Extremes had co-developed Unreal Tournament alongside Epic and their CEO Jamie Schmaltz explained to us that there were no real guidelines when it came to what got into the game which meant that Unreal Tournament had every type of map under the sun and some floating around it. Big maps, tiny maps, low gravity maps, space maps, what the fuck ever this is maps. This one's on the Normandy beaches. Is nothing sacred? No, sanctities for the week. There are no bad ideas in brainstorming and we need to get as many levels as possible on this disc 
to justify the cost. It's $19.99 for fuck's sake. This game has no single player campaign. I don't care if the level is a fucking pirate ship. Stick it on the disc. Yeehaw! But all of these maps, as wonderful and varied as they are, stand beneath the map we have come to talk about today. A map so brazen, so outlandish, and so iconic that 21 years later, if you mention Unreal Tournament maps, it's the first one people think about. A visual exclamation point, a flag carrier's nightmare, and a sniper's wet dream. Facing Worlds takes place on an asteroid orbiting Earth, on which two identical Mayan-looking towers face each other. It's a Capture the Flag map, and each flag is located at the base of its corresponding tower. The towers have no stairs, but upper areas can be reached via a selection of teleporters. The first brings the player to a mid-level viewing spot, from which the Redeemer spawns. The Redeemer, of course, being a portable nuclear weapon that you can pilot, Unreal Tournament is a weird game. The second brings you to a sniping perch halfway up the tower, and the third to the roof, where another sniper rifle spawns. And this, my friends, is where the magic happens. Headshot. Kill. You see, each tower has a full view of the entire battlefield, not just the other tower's sniping spots, but also the chamber where the enemy flag spawns, the majority of the spawn points, and the entire path between the two towers. It takes around 18 seconds to cross this treacherous no man's land, an area with zero cover aside from a hill in the middle which only protects you from ground level foes behind you. You are always at the mercy of the enemy snipers and their seemingly infinite supply of rifles, ammo, and pilotable nuclear launchers. So Facing World ultimately comes down to a sort of sniper battle, and how well you do rests entirely on the enemies you're facing. If you play this game online with real people, it's a frustrating stalemate, as the map so heavily favors defense over offense. In land play, with lower player numbers and some degree of coordination, you can plan rushes and off-ball strategies like camping in the flag room, or translocating up the tower and portaling down while the other team is in your base. But the way most people played Facing Worlds was with a bunch of bots on a comfortable difficulty setting. In this form, Facing Worlds becomes a sniper rifle power fantasy, a coconut shy where the targets are people's heads and the prizes sound like this. Monster kill, kill. You see, Unreal Tournament 99 was one of the first games to have the concept of an announcer, a disembodied voice to give you updates on the match and help you celebrate your meager accomplishments. Getting a kill multiplier in Unreal Tournament was just about the most exciting thing you could do, as the announcer regaled you with increasingly outlandish exaltations about your kill streak. But in 1999, this was just the coolest shit, and Facing Worlds was the easiest map to get a good kill streak on. Just leave the difficulty low, spawn in the maximum amount of bots, climb to the top of the tower, and keep on shooting. Headshot. Double kill. Facing Worlds was created by Cedric Fiorentino, and in a 2019 RPS article, he explained the map's interesting origins. For Unreal Tournament, we had a limit of 160 polygons visible at the same time. You'd typically spend half of your polygon budget on the landscape and have 80 or 70 left for your structures. I wanted to see what kind of landscape architecture could be built if I allocated all my 160 polygons for the buildings and worried about the landscape later. After several iterations on the various angles, windows, platform elevations, lift, and teleporter placement, it settled to its final form. I duplicated the towers, linked them by a bridge, and tried the gameplay. I love this. Facing World is a product of technological restrictions, creative restrictions. It takes place in space because the polygon budget was spent. It is teleporters instead of stairs because steps would have taken up too many triangles. But this stripped back minimalist style also gave it visual clarity and flow that many of the game's more labyrinthian levels didn't enjoy. Most UT99 players could draw a map of Facing Worlds, but ask them to sketch out the layout of Deck 16, Phobos, or Pressure, and act Accuracy is going to be all over the place. At a glance, facing worlds just make sense. There are no secret passages, there's no hidden weapons or unbreakable strategies. There's just two towers floating just above our planet's atmosphere. But it also has the same gravity as Earth, and nobody's wearing spacesuits. Wait a second. I'm willing to forgive a lot with Unreal Tournament 99. The pirate ship, the medieval castle, the level where you're just 
fighting on top of a spaceship at warp speed. But for some reason, facing worlds, I just can't seem to give it a pass. It just feels implausible, you know? There are too many asteroids floating around, and I'm pretty sure that moon is too big. Look, I'm no planetary scientist, but for some stupid reason, 100,000 people follow me on Twitter, so I don't know, maybe one of them is? And send tweets. All right, we wait. There are mountain lions here. Oh, here we go. Oh, wow, yeah, look at this guy. He's got a fucking ponytail and glasses. He must be an expert. Uh, I'm Carver Beerson. I'm a planetary scientist at Arizona State University. I study small bodies like Pluto and some asteroids in the asteroid belt amongst other worlds. If you saw this, right, say you're doing your normal day's job work and somebody says, we found this thing, it's fucking mental. Would you, like, assuming it's not an alien spaceship, assuming this is actually a, a real celestial body, what would be the most, like, <laughs> plausible explanation for this? The most plausible I could come up with is, you know, even if you're not going to aliens, maybe you, from the Earth, you had some mission to, like, drag an asteroid closer to the Earth, and you could, like, build some structures up on top of that. But that's pretty close to doable with technology we have. It's, it's technically possible, I think. Yeah, in general, the hard part of space is getting stuff off of the Earth. That's the expensive part, is uh, launching your rockets. So if you're dragging an asteroid close to the Earth anyways, I would definitely just use the stone on that asteroid to build any structures on top of it. The one thing that always worried me was the proximity to the Earth. Would, would this not get, like, sort of sucked in? What, what's stopping, like, the ISS from getting sucked in or something? Is something this close safe? Yeah, so with something like the space station, essentially what's happening is the Earth is pulling it down towards the surface, but you're moving so fast to the side that you're essentially always missing. So you get to stay in orbit going around. They're not too big. There would be basically no gravity if you're on that at all. Oh, oh really? Okay. The, that, those rocks underneath your feet there are so small that they are not gonna hold you down. If you're just like walking around, you'd be liable to just, with a normal step, launch yourself off and be flying off into space. <laughs> oh, that's ter that is That is haunting. Okay, so, so what I'm hearing is, I'm actually quite surprised. What I'm hearing is, is that if we were to go a couple of hundred years in the future, with enough resources, this isn't actually impossible. It's very, it's, it's a waste of resources, clearly. But you're saying it's like, it's maybe not feasible, but it's not impossible. Yes, I would agree. It's, it's possible. You just have to have some good reason for uh, spending all of that money to try and do it. The, I mean, the reason why is so that we can you know, have murder battles. Clearly, that's... Ah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> the why has been solved, sir. We don't need you for the why. <laughs> Dragging an asteroid into our orbit may be technically possible, but what seems impossible is that a map like this would feature in a AAA multiplayer shooter in 2022. These days, maps seem to be more conservative in their creativity, more catered to our needs, in most ways better designed, more beautiful and tactical, and enjoyed for many different types of playstyles. But when I compare them to facing worlds, something's missing. A spark of some kind. Look, I'm very aware this could be nostalgia. I was 13 when Unreal Tournament came out, and I'm 36 now, sitting in the middle of a field in California, at midnight, talking about a Capture the Flag map. But in those decades, the world of games development has changed quite a lot. So why? Why don't we see games like Halo Infinite, Call of Duty, or Overwatch make levels like this? Well, I have a few ideas. Squeal, boy, squeal! First of all, the cost of fidelity. Facing Worlds was created by a single developer with a budget of 160 polygons. The assets on modern video game maps dwarf that number, and players want that. Levels have to be detailed, beautiful, dense, which means more people working on them, and this cost incurred means that multiplayer shooters just have fewer maps these days, which means fewer weird outliers. The next issue was world building. Modern games are a lot more married to the internal logic of their universes. The battles in these games have real world motivations, characters have backstories, levels are usually in real places affected by the wider narrative of the game. Whereas back in 1999, Quake 3 had uh, flying eyeballs fighting cyber skateboarders in the voids of space. Nobody cared. Even Unreal Tournament's backstory was designed to be a 
a blank check where any idea could be possible. So the modern desire to have everything make sense within the wider universe of the game, it has created more interesting worlds, but it also produces far more creative restrictions. The death of community maps adds to this problem. In 1999, we were just as picky about level design. Good levels were celebrated and bad levels were lambasted. The difference was that games like UT99 had tools that allowed players to import and play maps made by other players. So if a map was shit, you just went on to the next one. Between the death of mod support and the rising complexity of making modern maps, there's just no longer this buffet-style ethos when it comes to playing levels. The walled gardens of DLC have only hampered this further, and as a result, we have fewer levels to play, and gamers expect every level to be the best version of it it can be. We're much less forgiving of bad ideas, which makes developers less likely to take creative risks. And lastly, of course, competitive gaming. In a world where every shooter flirts with having a competitive league, where even amateur players take tactics and strategy so seriously, you can't really enjoy a map like Facing Worlds. So what is the point here? that level designs have gotten too boring and too commercial, that we should return to the classic era of arena shooters. Well, no. As romantic and wonderful as that sounds, the reality is that in the past 20 years, level designers have come to understand what makes a good multiplayer level, and concepts of good and bad levels have been largely codified by gaming communities. The point is that time marches on, and that each era in game design is a reaction to the previous one. UT99 was a product of its time, when developers were trying to figure out what maps worked, when they couldn't render absolutely everything they wanted to. A time when we were trying to understand how to play these games. Hell, even a time where publishers were trying to figure out if people would buy them. It was an incredible period when it felt like we'd landed on a whole new world, and new ways of playing were around every corner. But it didn't last. We got sick of playing on these maps too. We wanted more realism, more strategy. We wanted developers not to rely on community map makers, but support games with new maps themselves. And over the years, games adapted and found new ground. This is why every arena shooter comeback has fallen flat, because as much as we think we want to play these levels, the world has moved on. And as much as we hate to admit it, in the past 20 years, so have we. Facing Worlds may not be a quote-unquote great map, but for PC gamers my age, it will always live fondly in memory, because it represents a simpler time when we were just figuring out what made these games fun. Which is why sometimes, late at night, I'll download the entire game in 20 seconds using modern internet, remap the movement from cursor keys to WSA&D, land on an asteroid floating around the Earth, and grab my sniper rifle. Facing Worlds is a terrible map if your priority is things like tactics and balance and esports, but it has something, something that a lot of maps, some of the best maps ever made, often don't have. It's got character. Dumb, unsubtle, obvious character. It's not a level that's designed for every playstyle. It's not a level that's designed to be realistic or to speak to some wider truth about Unreal Tournament. <laughs> It's just two towers on an asteroid with a bunch of sniper rifles. And sometimes, that's all you need. Congratulations, you are the winner.